Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get us started with our first presentation of the day. So this is a program called Arsenal. This is a stress reduction and resiliency tool. And to get started, I'm going to show us a short little video. It's from a few years ago, starring a novice up and coming actor. You may have heard of him. His name is Tom Hanks. I don't think we can make Hang on. Make any runway. There we go. Uh, what about over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah. Off your right side is Teterboro Airport. The LaGuardia departure. Got emergency inbound. This is Teterboro Tower. Go ahead. Uh, Cactus 1549 of the GW Bridge. Please go to the airport right now. Check. Does he need assistance? Yes, bird strike. Can I get him in for runway one? Obstacle, obstacle. Obstacle, obstacle. Full stop. Clear of conflict. No relapse for 30 seconds in the master one and two. Confirm off. Off. Wait 30 seconds. Too low. Terrain. Too low. Terrain. Too low. Terrain. Too low. Terrain. This is the captain. Brace for impact. Five miles. Texas fifteen forty nine. Turn right, speed zero. You can land runway one, Teterboro. We can't make it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? Go ahead. Try number one. Number one. No relay. We're gonna end up in the Hudson. Too low, terrain. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus? Too low, terrain. Too low, terrain. Put the flaps out, put the flaps out, flaps out. Cactus 1549, radar contact lost. Uh, you also got new work off at two o'clock at about seven miles. Got ah. flaps out, 250 feet in the air. Ah. Turn 70 miles. Got no power in either one. Try the other one. Try the other one. 49. We're rain. Still on? Clock. 150 miles. We're rain. Got flaps two. You want more? No, it's good. You got runway 29 available at Newark. It'll be 2 o'clock. It's 7 miles. You got any ideas? Clock. We're Actually, no. We're rain. We're rain. Full stop. Full stop. Full stop. Full stop. All right. So uh, let me just ask, does anybody actually remember that event? So for those who may be a little too young to remember, uh, this this movie came out in 2016. It's called Sully, and it's based on a real plane crash that happened in New York City in, I want to say, 2012, where uh, the plane was struck by an unprecedentedly large amount of birds and had to be put down in the Hudson River. Uh, fortunately, you know, this was a this was a good event. Uh, nobody got uh, seriously injured, nobody died. But um, we show this video because that's a pretty stressful situation, right? Uh, being in that situation where you're the captain, especially because this was something that had never happened before. This was something they had never trained for. This was something they had never planned for this, you know, at, towards the end of the movie, they're going over the investigation and, you know, the simulations showed that they could have made it back to an airport safely and in time. And then he asks them, 
how many times did it take them to get the simulation right? And it took them like 40 tries to be able to do it right. And this is them doing it the first time. And so that's why we like to show this video as part of this program. Um, so what is stress? Because that's what this is really about. Stress is in short, the nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. Anytime your environment or your situation is causing your body to demand change, that is stress. And so stress has a predictable effect. This is something that when we experience stress, we know what it does to our body and we know what we do to typically react to it. You know, a certain amount of stress is healthy. We need it because if we have no stress at all, excuse me, then our bodies aren't really doing anything, which means that we're not staying active. We're not actually engaging with life however what happens when stress accumulates that's when it starts to become a problem and that's when it starts to cause other problems for us so this is another humans thing. like all species have self-protective mechanisms to help us survive our fight flight or freeze survival response the fff for short is designed to mobilize our brain and body to fight an enemy run from an avalanche, or freeze to hide from a predator. Our brain sometimes misinterprets safe situations as dangerous and can set off false alarms. When the amygdala, our brain's watchdog, senses and barks danger, our body enters survival mode quicker than our rational mind can react, leaving it trying to figure out why we feel in mortal danger. When the FFF alarm is sounded, we start to breathe more quickly and shallow, causing hyperventilation, and our heart starts beating very fast. These changes can cause strong chest pain, which many people interpret as symptoms of a heart attack, when in fact it's just a result of the FFF activation, which can be relieved through breathing exercises. As a way of getting you ready for action, blood is diverted towards the major muscle groups, Blood flows away from our digestive system, causing the bladder to relax, and we might feel the need to pee. The mouth goes dry, nausea can occur, and we get the butterflies feeling in our stomach. Blood also rushes from extremities, leaving us with cold hands, but often sweaty palms as the action-ready body starts sweating to avoid overheating. Legs and hands can start trembling and feel weak, while tension starts building in big muscles like the thighs, neck, and shoulders. In our head, FFF alarms cause our brain to focus on negative memories, probably so it can scan them to avoid danger and negative outcomes. We get tunnel vision as our pupils dilate to increase our focus and long vision, but as a result, we lose our peripheral vision. FFF activation also reduces our ability to recognize differences in facial expressions. Too much oxygen and too little CO2 can result in dizziness or lightheadedness, which many people interpret as signs that they might faint. But because fainting is caused by a drastic drop in blood pressure, and because the FFF increases both our heart rate and blood pressure, it's nearly impossible to faint when this happens. Over time, depression, anxiety, and high levels of stress all harm the brain's ability to slow or cancel false FFF activations, causing them to happen more often. Knowing the symptoms of false activations makes it easier to recognize and reduce their effects. Right. So here are some of the effects of chronic stress on various parts of the body. Excuse me for just a second. So in the brain, you often have a lack of concentration and energy. You get headaches, dizziness, and over time, this can lead to depression, panic, and anger. In the heart, we have increased heart rate and blood pressure, which can lead to increased risk of high cholesterol and heart attack. In the stomach, we get upset stomach, acid reflux, pain, ulcers, and especially over time, uh, change in appetite and weight gain. 
Uh, this compromises the immune system as well, which leads to increased risk of illness or inflammation. Uh, joints, this affects joint pain, lowered bone density, muscle tension, tightness, and ultimately protein breakdown. And you also see this in the reproductive system with decreased hormone production, reduced fertility, and reduced sex drive. So there are what we like to say, there's four main, uh, hang on one second. Um, let's see. Okay. Better. Uh, there are four main sources of stress in most of our lives. Um, we have home, we have work, we have health, and we have the environment. And a lot of people don't like to think of home as their source of stress. I got to move that again because that's not a good place for it. Um, really? Oh, they don't? Because that seems like it would be a massive form well, of stress. It is. But think of it this way. You know, we always say your home is your castle. You know, you want mm -hmm. home to be that safe place away from the stress. But especially when you think of things like maintenance, finances, uh, the time and the energy required to keep your home up, it, it does create a large amount of stress for a lot of people. Um, work, you know, is there anyone here who says work is not one of their biggest causes of stress? Ironically, I would say that it's not my biggest cause of stress. Um, incidentally, the Jedi community is. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> the people I, I usually give this class to work is always their biggest cause of stress. Um, when it comes, you know, your relationship with your boss, your relationship with your other coworkers, your role in the organization, you know, communications, deadlines, your tempo, it, it can be very stressful for a lot of people. Um Health is a big one, nutrition, weight, rest. Uh, if you're injured, if you're aging, these are very common sources of stress. And then the environment, you know, noise, traffic, crowds, um, you know, the economy. The economy is a big source of stress for people, especially over the course of the last three years or so. So th this is kind of how we break down our sources of stress. All right, here we go. So uh, all of this comes from a, this This is a licensed program. This is not like something I made up or uh, started teaching on my own. This actually comes from a company called High Performing Systems. It's based out of Georgia and it was founded by this guy. You can kind of see him below, uh, below the presentation window, uh, Henry Thompson. The book in that image is called uh, The Stress Effect why smart leaders make dumb decisions and what to do about it. And the backstory to that is uh, the guy who wrote it, Henry Thompson, he was a Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army in the Special Forces. Sure. And he realized at one point, you know, we have a lot of smart, competent, good people in higher command making terrible decisions. Why? why? Why are these otherwise competent and intelligent people making such terrible decisions? And so he decided to study it, and ultimately it came down to stress. And in the stress effect, he outlines the seven best practices of the Arsenal program, which are all conveniently wrapped up in the name, and you see that on the left of the screen, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So awareness, rest, support, exercise, nutrition, attitude, and learning. These are our framework for reducing stress and increasing resilience. So just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about over the course of the next uh, hour or so. Um, so we're here in the overview of the Arsenal program. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we're going to structure the rest of the class and then we're just going to jump right on into it. Um, the first three aspects of the program 
talk about controlling stress that we already have. How do we get a handle on that stress when we are having it? And then the other four aspects of the program focus on increasing our capacity. That is to say, increasing our ability to handle stress by basically, you know, think of stress like a tank. And, and by a tank, I mean like a gas tank. Like um, think of it as being able to hold so much stress before it starts becoming a problem. This is what we're dealing with in the last four aspects of the program is increasing the size of that tank so that you can hold more stress in it before it starts becoming a problem. And then we'll take a look at, um, you know, some things you can do to increase uh, your aspects. So before we get started, I want to talk about the Word document that I put in the chat. So if everyone can go ahead and open that up, what we're going to be doing is we are going to use the first page of that Word document, but that's going to come in at the very end. What we're going to be most concerned with over the course of this training is the second page of that Word document. And this is how you're going to rate yourself over the course of the last week or two weeks or so um, in how you've been feeling, excuse me, in each of these seven areas. And we're not going to do it all at once. We're going to go through each area and then talk about, you know, what might someone who's at the lower end of the scale look like? What might someone who's at the higher end of the scale look like for each of the seven areas? So um, there will be time for you to do that, but please keep that in mind that that is how we're going to be using the Word document over the course of this presentation. Um, this is another resource that we use. Um, it's a book called Go Wild, Eat Fat, Run Free, Be Social, and Follow Evolution's Other Rules for Total Health and Well-Being. It's a great book. It's a great set of stories. The reason why we introduced this one as well is The Stress Effect is a good book, but it's very data-driven and it's very research-based. If you want a book that isn't quite so academic about the subject, look at this one. This one is also really good. So we recommend this as well. Let me see if I can. All right. There we go. So what is awareness? Let's dive right on in and talk about our first best practice. So it is, I'm going to try and move this again. Let's see if I can. Okay, there we go. So it's alertness and preparation and your ability to notice new things. And it acts as a scale between unfocused and focused. So why does awareness matter? <laughs> because an unaware brain is a surprised brain. You're surprised by your circumstances and you're surprised by your emotions. So this is another example of being aware. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. What, what, how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. <laughs> it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Yeah. 
this this actually ran on british te british television as an ad for uh bicycle safety um there's another video that i like to use as part of this sometimes uh called the invisible gorilla if anyone's ever heard of that experiment um what that one was was the video starts with the prompt uh people are going to be throwing red and yellow balls around count how many times the yellow ball gets thrown and it starts out pretty simple with one ball of each color getting thrown back and forth it's pretty easy to count they start adding more balls and then about halfway through someone walks into the frame in a gorilla costume and what they found was basically one of two things happen either people see the gorilla and they lose count of how many times the ball is getting thrown or the more interesting one they're so focused on counting the balls, they don't even see the gorilla. So this is just some fun examples of awareness. So how do we improve our awareness? How do we train that? Well, here are some tools for it. Meditation, mindfulness, listening, uh, journaling, biometrics is a great one if you have um, any kind of smartwatch or other smart technology that'll keep track of things like your heart rate, over the course of the day gives you a great amount of uh, information that you can use as far as your awareness goes. You know, if you're, if your biometrics track, like, oh, your heart rate was really high at this one particular point in the day, you can kind of think back to, okay, what was I doing that at that one point in the day that might've caused this increased heart rate uh, and feedback, talking to people about, your experiences and about what's going on is a great way of improving your awareness. So this is our self-assessment scale that I talked about earlier on the second page of that handout. And this is where we want you to rate yourself over the course of the last week or the last two weeks, because, you know, the holiday week, I'm sure nobody's really up on their stress management during the week between Christmas and New Year's. So um, if you're at the lower end of the scale toward the one, you're feeling fuzzy, you're zoning out, you're daydreaming, or you're frequently surprised. Whereas if you're towards the higher end of the scale, you're feeling focused, you're really feeling, uh, you're aware of everything that's happening, and you're feeling ready to take on any potential challenges. And while you think about that, let's talk about rest. Actually, can I ask a question? Or go Absolutely. Back. Let's go back. Let's see if I can. Come on. There we go. Okay. So one of the things about stress, especially during this point in time, it's not necessarily that you feel fuzzy or zoned out or daydreaming or frequently surprised, but you might feel hyper aware and uh, hyper... What, yeah, hyper awareness. So where would you exactly put yourself on a scale if you feel like, okay, yeah, I'm hyper aware, I fit the eight, but my stress is actually more towards the, should be more towards fuzzy. So uh, we're <laughs> going to tie it all together at the end. But oh. if you feel that, it, if you feel <laughs> that you're hyper aware, you can definitely put yourself more towards the eight or the nine side of the scale. The, this is not at at this point in time at this point in the presentation we're not looking at this as it relates to stress we're just looking at it as this one particular aspect okay got it sorry i jumped ahead <laughs> no 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 that that's fine it 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 shows that you're engaging with you know what we're here to do is talk about stress okay. uh, so let's talk about rest you know Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you don't get enough sleep, you're going to end up fat, sick, and stupid. And, let's see. and all high-performing systems require downtime. Again, this is the guy who created the program. And for those of you who may work with engineers or work with heavy machinery, you've probably heard the phrase, if you don't schedule your maintenance, your equipment will schedule it for you. So this applies to our bodies as well as anything else. 
There are three kinds of rest that we like to talk about during the Arsenal program. So sleep is the big one. It's what everyone thinks about when we talk about rest. But there are other types of rest that are just that's recovery. Excuse me. And recreation. And I see is someone trying to say something or. No. OK. Um, so we're going to talk about all three of these and about how we can do these effectively. So let's start by talking about sleep. So for those who don't know, when you when we're actually sleeping well, uh, let's see, where can I put this that it's effective? Okay, that's, that's a good place for it. So um, there are actually four phases of sleep. And in a normal night, if you're getting proper restful sleep, you'll go through these four phases, uh, usually about three or four times. It takes about 90 minutes total to go through all four phases. So uh, in phase one, this is when we transition between being awake and being asleep. This lasts about five to 10 minutes. And this is the easiest time to wake someone who's asleep. And you see on the screen, this is when your cortex activity starts to drop by as much as 40%. In phase two of sleep, you start seeing the undulations in the brain waves interspersed with sleep spindles. Uh, this is when your body temperature drops and your heart rate drops. And this takes about 20 minutes for this phase. We get to phase three. This is when the brain waves become very slow and drawn out. Uh, this is when your blood pressure and your breathing start to drop. And this is when you start getting into the deepest part of your sleep cycle. It's hardest to wake someone up if they're in phase three or phase four. And phase three will last between about 30 to 60 minutes. Then we get to phase four. This is when uh, REM sleep really starts occurring. This is when you dream. Uh, your body starts relaxing and becomes immobilized as your normal blood flow is transferred um, away from the parts of you that are usually moving. And this takes about 20 to 40 minutes. So this is a look at what you should be experiencing when you are having an actual restful sleep. This PowerPoint has decided it doesn't want to work today. Okay, so uh, there's two big sleep hormones that we like to talk about. So the first one is melatonin. Um, how many people have ever taken melatonin to help them get to sleep? Yeah. So this is a hormone that your body produces naturally, and it's what helps you decide, okay, it's time to go to sleep. Serotonin uh, is often talked about as the happy chemical. It is, but it does play a very important role in sleep in that it is produced by light and activity. And serotonin is one of the things that not only helps us stay awake, but it's one of the things that helps us wake up in the first place. So if you're having very high levels of serotonin relative to your levels of melatonin, it's not going to be as easy for you to fall asleep because it's not going to be as easy for your body to know when it needs to go to sleep. Um, so here are some things you can do to help get better sleep. Staying active. The more active you are during the day, the more tired you're going to be at night. Limit caffeine and alcohol. Caffeine is a big one. Those who don't know, the half-life of caffeine is about 10 hours. So if you have a nice big cup of coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning to get your workday started, excuse me, half of the caffeine in that cup of coffee is still active in your body at six o'clock at night. So that is how long it's going to take that caffeine to work its way through your body. And if you're having problems with sleep, limiting or cutting out the amount of caffeine that you're taking in throughout the day, especially if, you know, coffee is one thing, but especially if you're drinking energy drinks, they are really, really dangerous at uh, causing caffeine spikes. And I say that because um, 
I normally teach this class for the military, so there's a lot of people who drink a lot of energy drinks on the job. Um, take a warm shower. You know, cold shower will wake you up by the same principle. A warm shower will help you get to sleep. It'll help tire you out, and it will help your body set the expectation that it's entering a lower energy state. Turn your phone off or put it on silent. You know, this is going to play into another one that we're going to get into later in the slide, but your phone is keeping you awake. If you stop using your phone or any other kind of screen about an hour before bed, that's when you're going to get a lot better sleep. Read a book, you know, in the same way that staying active makes your body more tired compared to reading a book, compared to using your phone or using your TV, your computer or other electronics, reading a book actually does make your mind tired as well. Uh, lights out. This kind of goes, this is where I said the phone is going to come up later. Turning the lights out or going to a lower light environment does uh, help kick up the production of melatonin. And making it a daily routine. This is one that um, I, I can speak to this personally. This works. If you go to bed every night at nine o'clock, even if you're not actually tired, your body is going to start associating the time of nine o'clock with time to go to bed. So uh, definitely try and do that if you can. So, yeah, I'm going to just move this up here and stop worrying about it. Um, so when we talk about recovery, when we look at stress versus performance, if PowerPoint decides wants to cooperate with me, uh, this graph actually looks more like a bell curve. And this is what we call our optimal performance zone in the middle. And this is what we kind of want to focus on when we talk about recovery. Because if you're putting too much stress on yourself, you're going to burn out. But interestingly enough, if you don't have enough stress, you're going to rust out, you're going to lose your skills, you're going to lose your proficiencies, and you're going to be less effective overall. So we want to stay within this optimal performance zone. And we're going to talk about this more as it relates to one of the other aspects, but this is still something to keep in mind when talking about recovery. And then recreation. Um, so just as a rhetorical, what do you do for fun? Um, our definition of recreation is recreation is activity that engages the whole person at a low stress level. This can include any number of things, but what you want to be aware of is that recreation isn't just, you know, turning everything off and going to sleep. That's not effective recreation. And if anyone's ever heard of nature therapy, you know, immersion in nature increases the benefit of recreation on the mind and on the body. So these are some recreation and recovery tools, you know, do something fun every day, do something that you enjoy doing. This includes group activities, but also hobbies, you know, take intentional breaks. Um, this is something that you know, when we were going through the training to be taught how to teach this class, one of my coworkers pointed uh, this out as something I do. That, you know, I leave the, I try to make an effort to leave the office for about an hour every day. And I take my lunch and I take my lunch and I take a book with me and it's like, don't talk to me. Don't bother me. You know, I'm here if you need me. If there's an emergency, call me. But during this hour, don't bother me with work stuff. And then we put Sabbath keeping here, not in the sense of religion. Uh, but what we want everyone to make sure of is that you're taking, you know, a day once a week that you don't deal with anything that we normally consider stressful. You're not working. You're not doing any of your other tasks. Take that day to de-stress and rejuvenate yourself. And take your leave, please. Everyone gets some time up, time off from work. Nobody works 365 days a year. 
take advantage of the time that you have off from work because that is something that we see is a large contributor to workplace stress if you're never taking your time off. So as we did earlier with awareness, we're gonna look at your rest. How restful have you been? This is kind of a bad time to be doing this slide because I'm pretty sure nobody's been doing a whole lot of resting over the course of the last couple of weeks as we build up to the holidays. But think about it. Have you been exhausted? Have you been cranky or distracted or sluggish? Or have you actually been feeling refreshed, relaxed, alert, and energetic? Have you been having meaningful rest over the course of the last week or the last couple of weeks? All right. Let's talk about support. I got another video for you. Come on. Here's there the shocking go. truth about loneliness. This is why we need to take it more seriously. Surveys show one out of three adults are lonely and the health impacts of loneliness are shocking. Studies have shown that people who are lonely are 50% more likely to die before their time. Researchers show that loneliness is as damaging to our health as not smoking one, not two, but 15 cigarettes per day. Only around half of Americans say they have meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with a loved one, family, or friend every single day. Members of Generation Z say they are the loneliest generation and experience more health problems as a result of it. Loneliness was also linked with less physical activity, compulsive use of digital technology, and not being able to share our problems with others. In a study of 20,000 adults, 54% say that they don't know one person that knows them well. Additionally, 56% of people said that the people they surround themselves with are not necessarily with them, and approximately 40% said that they lack companionship, don't have meaningful relationships, and feel isolated. All of us have been in the crowd that felt lonely. All of us have been invited to a party or wanted to leave. All of us have likes on social media but don't feel loved in real life. So many of us can get comments on our posts but can't get a friend to call us back. Loneliness is real. So here's what we have to do. After studying over 2,500 consumers over six years, research found that people that see material possessions as a sign of success felt more lonely. Investing our money in experience rather than things is a great way of breaking the loneliness and materialism cycle. Schedule a time each day to talk to a friend. Take a class to learn something new. Volunteer to deepen your sense of purpose. Spend time with people who look more like your future than your past. The mental health charity Mind cites two factors that can cause loneliness. Someone either not having enough social contact or more interestingly, being surrounded by people but not feeling understood, loved or cared for. Notice, it's not just being around people but being understood. It's not just being invited and present but feeling like you're contributing. Loneliness really comes then from a lack of significance or lack of worth and what you bring to the table and what value you truly offer. Lonely is not being alone. It's the feeling that no one loves you. So start by loving yourself. All right, so when we talk about support, this is, I, I know everyone loves the Minion photo. Um, one of the things we talk about is a tribe. And, you know, I don't know about some of you, but when I hear the word tribe, I think, you know, the National Geographic magazines that my mother never let me look at because they had all the naked women in them. Um, but when we think about a tribe, there's a lot of functions that go along with that. Things like safety, security, provision, connection, identity, 
So think about that for a few minutes, you know, think about who is your tribe, who is who you go to, to feel supported and to get that kind of support. And interestingly enough, as part of this, you know, it's been shown that groups and support in general have had great effect helping survivors healing from trauma. You know, through support groups, survivors are likely to move forward in their healing and continue on their path to recovery. And, you know, I have a guy I work with who teaches this class as well, and he was a chaplain with the VA, and he spent part of his time as a clinical chaplain dealing with groups of Vietnam vets. And this is what he found as part of that work is that, you know, even if they weren't all in the same part of the conflict, this is something that they they all understood uh, what each of them had gone through and their presence and their ability to come together and share those experiences led to a greater amount of healing than in groups that felt that they couldn't relate to each other. So think about this. Think about what your support community looks like. Think about where you would go if you're in the scenario that you need support. Think of who can come to you for support as well. So we have our self-assessment again. So how have you been feeling as it relates to support? Have you been feeling isolated or disconnected or lonely and closed off? Or have you really been feeling engaged, connected, supported, and open about your support and your need for support? Um, because we've hit the first three wickets, I'm going to take a few minutes to so I see there's 26 chat notifications. I'm going to take a few minutes and read some of those. And if anyone has any other questions that they want to ask about what we've talked about so far, please, please, please use this time to uh, bring those up. Let's see. So I would just like to say that your tribe doesn't necessarily have to be someone that you go to in person. As I said in my comments in there, coffee's hot for life. My girl's in here. Um, our support network, just to kind of give you an idea, is actually me and two other Jedi in the community that just get together and we talk. And when some of the other Jedi call in, we just add them to the call. Uh, you know, and we support each other. And it's like, I've got Sarah, who's in Michigan. Another guy, Ross in Chicago. I'm here in South Carolina. Down in Charleston, I'm in upstate. So down in Charleston, Sophia will call. And then um, Maggie, who's in the DC area, will call. And those are usually the ones that we use, we, we bring into our calls. Anybody else is free to call in <laughs> during the days. Like we sit here, we camp out and we just work from home while we're talking and complaining about work or complaining about the community or showing some love about how we absolutely adore people. It's really fun. So, you know, phone calls are equally useful. And historically in the community, Force Academy was a big support network for me. And that's just through chat. So, you know, your tribe does not have to be local. Right. I do want to address uh, one thing in the comments. Um, you know, the before their time mean, what, what does that mean when the video talked about people dying before their time? What this means is, you know, generally speaking, unless something is really physically wrong with them or they get into an accident or something, no person in what we call the first world should be dying in their 30s or 40s or even earlier than that. Basically, you know, I, I'm generalizing, but that's um what we're talking about we're talking about um you know when we think of uh <laughs> when we talk about you know what we think of as your time we th we think of older people we think of you know people who've lived lived very full lives and they're ready to just you know say good night but um that's generally what 
that kind of thing is re is referring to. All right. Who is ready to talk about exercise? There we go. I'm not going to read all of these. No. That would, yeah. No, no exercise. Exercise bad. The army ruined me. <laughs> I'm not going to read through all of these because it is a pretty big list, but you can see a lot of different benefits to exercise. Um, and a lot of these do feed into some of the other areas. So how many of you guys have ever seen this guy before? So this is a blue sea squirt. And it looks pretty simple, but it's actually a vertebrate it's act it has a spine and a central nervous system and it actually has a brain for a little while at least so this is a this is a creature that floats in the water and survives on plankton and what it does is it'll find a current that a lot of plankton swim through and when it finds that good spot it'll cement itself to something and then here's where it gets interesting it actually digests its own brain and it becomes, you know, a vegetable, essentially. Because at that point, it doesn't need its brain any longer. So it digests it to add, to both give it more nutrients from the act of digesting it, but also to take away the activity of the brain that would take away nutrients that it doesn't need to be wasting. Um, I had something else in my notes about this. So... Um, when we talk about this as it relates to ourselves and exercise, there's theories that, you know, your brain is necessary for movement, but it's also the other way around, that movement is necessary to maintain the health of your brain. So when we talk about exercise, we need a couple of different things from our exercise. We need intensity. You know, it's no good to just go to the gym and lift two pound weights the entire time every day you go to the gym. That's not actually helping you. But what we also need is variety. You know, one of the reasons why going to the gym every day and lifting two pound weights doesn't help you is because you're doing the same thing every day. And you can do the same thing every day if you have a varied workout. You know, I do a few different things when I go to the gym. I, you know, I do bike, I do the elliptical, and I do some uh, hammer swings. So I get a little bit of strength and a little bit of cardio and a little bit of core in every workout. But you need that kind of variety. That's why people say never skip leg day. Ultimately, what we need is a balance. We need to be able to keep our exercise balanced around our need for both intensity and variety. So when we talk about intensity, we looked at this graph earlier, our optimal performance zone. This is what I said, you know, if you do too much intensity, you're going to burn out. But if you don't do enough intensity, you're going to rust out. Lift it, at least lift the 10 pound weights. I know it feels like a lot more than the two pound weights, but if you only do the two pound weights, you're never going to get any stronger. And this is just one example of variety. Do a whole bunch of different things or do, you know, do the same thing, but do it a different day. You know, make Wednesday arm day, make Thursday back day, whatever you have to do to get that variety in your exercise. And when we talk about balance, we're talking about the different kinds of variety that we need. So basically, as a general rule, you need these five different types of exercise in order to maintain your balance. You need strength, you need agility, you need stability, flexibility, and endurance. So this is just a couple examples of how you can get all of those things. You get your strength from weightlifting, you can get agility from martial arts, uh, balance comes, uh, your stability will come from your core, running is a good way to get endurance, and then yoga for flexibility. So Keep in mind just there's a whole bunch of different things you can do to exercise and you do need to be doing some of it. And then recovery is definitely important for exercise. You know, 
This is one of the reasons why we say, you know, take a rest day, you know, because if you're constantly exercising and you're constantly pushing that intensity, eventually you're going to break down. So we need to maintain your recovery so that we can continue to exercise longer. So again, how has your exercise been over the course of the last couple of weeks? You know, have you been sedentary, low energy, not having a whole lot of variety? Have you been injured? You know, there's no, this is not a value uh, scale. This is not to say that being at one side of the scale is better or worse than the other, because there's times that that happens. This is just, um, this is just, a, this is a self-assessment. This is, you know, how have I been feeling over the course of the last couple of weeks? You know, or have we been towards the higher end of the scale where we're active, we have a lot of energy, we're doing, we're getting that variety in, and we're making sure to properly recover from the exercise that we're doing. And now for the part of the show that you hate the most and I find humiliating, nutrition. <laughs> I, I hate this one because th I know I'm the worst at this one. Th this is my worst aspect and I know that. And I've made my peace with it, but I still hate teaching these slides because of it. So this is what we think we need when it comes to nutrition. Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, you can't outrun a bad diet, that's, that statement is true for like 99% of the people. And you're probably not the 1% that it doesn't apply to. This is what we actually need. We need a diet that will support our exercise. How do we get, well, uh, part of this is understanding hunger. You know, am I really hungry? Is it a physical hunger or is it an emotional hunger? If it's a physical hunger, it'll come on gradually and you can postpone it. You know, I, you know, how many people have gone like six hours or more before they had something to eat? That That's a physical hunger that comes on because you've been postponing that. It can be satisfied with any type of food. You're not going to, you know, physical hunger. You, if, if, if you get to a certain point, you can eat shoe leather and it'll still satisfy you. You should probably never let yourselves get to that point, but that point does exist. And then with physical hunger, once you're full, you can stop. And it'll lead to a feeling of satisfaction. Meanwhile, if you're emotionally hungry, it comes on very suddenly like you're you, all of a sudden you you're not feeling it and then oh my god i need to eat something it feels very urgent you can't feel you feel like you can't postpone it and this often accompanies specific cravings especially pizza chocolate other junk food you know if you feel that you really need that one specific thing this is probably emotional hunger you tend to eat more than you normally would, and it leaves you feeling very uncomfortably full, especially because that often triggers feelings of guilt. You know, we talk about nutrients. We need macronutrients and micronutrients. And as the, I thought he was going to wait for me to click before he showed up again, you need to drink water as well. So it's very important to understand where you're getting uh, your nutrients from your macronutrients are going to come from carbs, proteins, and fats, whereas your micronutrients are coming from your minerals and your fruits and your vegetables. So having a good balance is really what's going to improve this aspect. How do we do it? Well, here's a practical model. You know, don't, don't, don't listen to the food pyramid. The food pyramid was not a good idea. This is actually it, it's not perfect, but it's a better uh, model. You know, eat real food, especially if you find that you're eating a lot of processed stuff, that is going to add up. And that is what's going to cause a lot of problems with your nutrition. Uh, don't eat too much. Don't eat until you're full every single time. And eat mostly plants. Eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of starches, not as much protein. I know. A lot of people are going to find that one in particular to be very insulting. I know I love my chicken. I can't, I, if you're going to tell me to stop eating chicken, sorry, not happening. But uh, 
so this is our nutrition assessment. And especially with the holidays and everybody's eating and everybody's getting fed by family, this is probably a time a lot of it, a lot of us are a lot lower on the scale than we normally would be. But, you know, assess yourself. Have you been eating a lot of junk food? Have you been doing the yo-yo diet where you do a whole lot of work and lose a whole ton of weight very, very quickly? And then as soon as you lose the weight, you stop with the diet and you go straight back up to where you were. Um, have you been over or under eating? And have you been having a lack of variety? You know, I'm a very picky eater, so I'm very comfortable eating the same thing three or four times a week. That's one of the reasons why I'm down towards the lower end of this scale. Or have you been eating clean? Have you been eating with consistency uh, to get to where you want to be? Have you been having that balance and that variety in your food? Um, I know, like like I said, I hate teaching these slides because I know this is my worst one. Uh, realistic optimism. I know everyone loves this image. Uh, when we teach this class, you know, the three glasses of lemonade, I'm half full, I'm half empty. I think this is piss. Um, so for anyone who's listening, how many of you have heard of the Stockdale paradox or know uh, where it comes from? Um, nope. Uh, well, thank you, because now I get to teach something. Um, <laughs> So Admiral James Stockdale was a prisoner of war during uh, Vietnam, and he was held in the famous Hanoi Hilton. And he noticed a couple of things about the people he was imprisoned with. And it's that obviously the people who thought that this was the end of everything and they were never going to get out of here, they didn't end up doing so well. But conversely, the people who were overly optimistic and were like, we're going to get rescued today. Eventually, they also started not doing so well. And so this is where he came up with his Stockdale paradox. So retain faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And at the same time, confront the most brutal aspects of your current reality, whatever they might be. Sometimes it sucks, but you got to do it. And acknowledging that it sucks while still believing that you're going to get it done does actually do more for your attitude than just being overly happy about it or overly sad about it. So these are some attitude adjustment practices. Um, you know, the happiness advantage creates lasting positive change. This is what we want to accomplish by talking about attitude. You know, if you can do three gratitudes per day, if you can do some journaling, uh, meditation, random acts of kindness, and, you know, exercise, I'm going to talk about this more a little bit later, but, you know, the more you exercise, the better you feel. Except for people who were broken by the army. Exactly. <laughs> you know so, what? Also, there's actually another attitude thing here that I kind of want to point out. I know it's not in your class, but Victor please. Frankel, Victor yep. Frankel did work on the meaning yeah. of life. Yep, I have that book yes. up. Yeah, it, it's a really good book. We actually uh, did a kind of like a book club on it at Force Academy one time. There was another um, Scott. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> but for anyone who hasn't read it, Viktor Frankl was actually in Auschwitz. And what he learned was that the people who actually had something that they could look forward to afterwards, something that gave their life meaning, they were the ones that as long as they didn't end up in um, in the actual chamber, they were the ones that survived the longest as long as they could hold on to that meaning. Yep. And I actually just got another book on the same subject. Uh, Harold Kushner's when bad things happen to good people. There you so, go. That's a good one too. Um, or at least I've heard a lot about it. I haven't read it yet. It's on my it, list. Got it for Christmas. So, um, <laughs> so let's talk about your attitude. Have you been pessimistic or reactionary? Have you been overwhelmed or have you been avoiding the things that make you stressed out or emotional. 
Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, have you been realistically optimistic? Have you been able to respond to things? Have you been confident? And have you been engaged in what's going on around you? Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. And with that, we come to our last seventh best practice, lifelong learning. So what we've found is that the learning is itself an attitude and it is a muscle. Your brain is a muscle. So what you need to do is you need to exercise that muscle. Um, I think it's the next slide. I have another video. I don't know if it's the next slide or the slide after the video is a few years old. And so it references a couple of people that not everyone in this room is comfortable with. I understand Please remember that it's a few years old and it, it's talking about attitudes and what it's talking about in the video is at the very least um, not related to the reasons why certain people don't like one of the people in this video. Okay, so it's not the next one. Um, so we talk about lifelong learning and we talk about how the different disciplines interact. You know, we've seen this where people who learn um, math are better able to follow things like uh, certain kinds of music because math is all about the structure and the form, and they're able to translate that into the music. And it's actually one of those things that goes both ways is people who are able to appreciate um, not just music, because basically everyone appreciates some kind of music music but appreciating the structure of the music can lead to a better understanding of math and science um interestingly enough if you want to go if you're someone who's you know still looking at a career path if you're interested in working in law the best major for you to study in college is not pre-law it's actually philosophy. The reason for that is pre-law focuses a lot on, you know, teaching you some of the things that you should be learning in law school, like case law and research habits and study habits. But that's not what's actually going to make you succeed as a lawyer. What you learn in philosophy is things like logic and reasoning, and those are the things that make you succeed. And that's why philosophy majors do better on the LSAT than any other subject. It's like kind of how people who study Latin in high school do better on the SATs, at least as far as the language portion is concerned, than any other foreign language, because Latin forms such a basis for the English language. Here we go. Here's the video. Mindset. Come on. That matters. There we go. She was nearly homeless, raising a child by herself, and her book had been rejected by 12 publishers. She grew up speaking English as a second language, and when she got to college, she struggled to write well. He was cut from his varsity basketball team and cried when he got the news. I felt very disappointed, and I could easily say that, you know, I, I give up on it. From the basketball court, to the classroom. Everyone has times when they feel like they failed, when all they want to do is give up. I hated school. I didn't have confidence before it all. I have low self-esteem, I guess. Maybe feel nervous and embarrassed. But if these people once felt that way too, then how did J.K. Rowling turn herself into one of the most famous writers in the world? How did Sonia Sotomayor become the first Latina Supreme Court justice ever? And Michael Jordan, the best basketball player on earth. Natural talent, away with words, pure brain power. That's only part of the story. Most successful people are successful because to them, failure isn't a reason to quit. It's an invitation to work harder because they know that intelligence, skill, they don't just come naturally. You have to try and fail try and fail and then get up and do it again you have to know that with the right mindset with effort 
focus and perseverance, you can always improve. And that's an idea that's backed up by science. Inside your brain are hundreds of billions of cells called neurons that communicate with one another. When you encounter something new, when you learn, those neurons fire, reshaping old connections and making new ones. Like a muscle, those new connections get stronger the more you exercise them. In other words, it's not what you're born with that matters, it's what you do with it. So when a publisher told JK Rowling to get a real job, instead she stuck with it. She kept writing and got better with each sentence. When Michael Jordan didn't make varsity, he took it as a challenge. He went back to the gym to practice and trained himself to be the player he became. I could easily say that, you know, I, I give up on it. But instead, I utilize it to where, hey, I'm going to prove you wrong. I think that lesson was more uh, in life, not just in basketball. That if you stumble, get up. When Sonia Sotomayor got a bad grade on her first paper in college, she developed a strategy. She went to the bookstore, bought a stack of books on basic grammar, and practiced writing in English until she nailed it. Anyone who ever feels like they're not sure about what they can do, they can look at my life and I hope say to yourselves, it's just like me. And if she could make it, so can I. Become a Supreme Court justice, win five MVP titles, sell 400 million books, if you seek out challenges, don't sweat the setbacks. Ask for help when you need it and believe you can always get better. Like I understand it now and I like have confidence. I'm going to study pretty long because I want to be an attorney. I feel like a good person. Who knows what might happen? Failure taught me things about myself that I could have learned no other way. I discovered that I had a strong will and more discipline than I had suspected. It is impossible to live without failing at something, unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all. So one of the things we talk about when we talk about learning is how it informs the other aspects. And this is when the program really starts to come full circle. And you realize that all of these, um, all of these practices inform the other practices. If you have good nutrition, you're going to be better able to exercise. If you get good exercise, you're going to be better able to rest. If you have a good support network, you're going to have a better attitude. If you're learning, you're going to be more aware. And there's interplays between all of these different aspects. And that's really what we want to uh, harp on when it comes to learning. And we especially want to focus on habit. Like I said earlier, you know, the brain is a muscle. And it's only going to get better if you exercise it. What we find, however, is that a lot of people don't stick with the practice long enough to see the results. So this is kind of the model of how habits form. You know, a trigger happens that leads you to get a craving. Like, I, I want to change that. So I want to do something about it. So you start taking action and you get a reward. But where what we found is where most people trip up is that the distance between action and reward is not quite as short as it is on this slide. So people stop doing the action before they actually get to the reward. So we want you to, we want you to keep at it. We want you to keep trying and keep doing so that you can get that habit. So, um, some learning strategies. Uh, like I said, this is a military training I do. So if you're not in the military, ignore the MWR digital library. If you are in the military, Please take a look at your branch's MWR libraries. Um, for everyone, the Brain HQ app, uh, it's a great recommendation. It has a whole bunch of different brain games that you can play. You know, it gives you a new one every day, and it really does help train that muscle and that exercise. I particularly like uh, puzzles like Sudoku and Nonograms, um, but 
you know, anything that gets that mind moving uh, will have a great effect. And so here we have our self-assessment of learning. Have you been uh, stagnant, distracted? Uh, have you been having poor habits or have you been procrastinating? I know this is one of mine. Or have you been, uh, you know, curious, focused, intentional, and disciplined over the course of the last couple of weeks? Uh, before we move on to the last part of the training, does anyone have any questions about anything we've gone over since our last question break while I read the chat? I guess the only thing I would say is uh, to make a comment. MWR. Like, I know that you said ignore that, but if you happen to go to your local library, you might be able to find a book. That said, <laughs> even if you do have an MWR or you have a local library, it is nice to sometimes have a place where you can take notes and you can't do that in a public book. No, no. So maybe you... just pick up the book yourself. <laughs> I I personally disagree with that because... I, I'm one of those people who don't like writing anything in my books. Uh, oh, well, that's fine. I'm just saying, though, if, you, if you're if you the kind of person that does do that, you know, pick up the book anyway. <laughs> so uh, this is our first page of the handout. This is the Arsenal chart. And we are going to take your self-assessment that you've been taking notes on throughout this whole uh, presentation, and you're going to plot yourself on the chart. As so, so one is in the center of the chart, nine is where the letters are. And you're gonna plot yourself for each of your seven practices. And then if you want, you can kind of draw a picture between them and see you know, where your high areas are, where your low areas are. I th is this my chart? This might be my chart. It's not, but I love that joke. Um, so, you know, the thing of looking at this is what are we low in so this person could probably use a lot of help with their nutrition they could get a little bit better exercise they can do a little bit more learning and get some support but what is this person doing really well this person is resting really well and they have a really good attitude so how can we use those um to better inform our lower areas and this is uh you know, it's not necessarily something you have to do right now. It's not necessarily something I have all the answers for, but just something for you to think about how your self-assessment links up with all of the other areas. Um, these are a couple additional resources. Again, like I said, so um, I didn't say this earlier. And for those who are not in the Force Academy who don't know me personally, I am active duty Navy and I work with the chaplain's office at Navy Region Mid-Atlantic with the Credo de Department. That's our logo in the bottom right of the screen. And this is kind of like my whole job is teaching classes like this. Uh, we do this class, we do classes based around a whole bunch of other subjects, including uh, you know, marriage prep, uh, suicide prevention, you know, office communication, personal communication. We do a whole bunch of stuff like that. And that's why uh, we got into teaching this class. I would have loved to teach some of the other classes we do, uh, but this is the only one that I could slide down to fit in the time slot because the only other class I teach that's three hours long like this one is Safe Talk. And that is an actual like license program that I'm not allowed to change the time slot of. And everything else we teach is longer than three hours and we really need all of that time to make it work. But um, you know, for those who are in the military, look at your MWR digital library, look at Military One Source. There's a lot of resources there uh, to help you manage your stress. If you're a civilian, um, look at AuthenticHappiness.org. And if you're looking for more things for you to do lifelong learning with, look at TED Talks, look at Masterclass, um, all sorts of opportunities for learning are present all you have to do is find them. And I think this is my last slide. 